Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, today we come before you again. We know that you have made this world and have shown your love for all the people in it from the beginning of their existence. You've been our help in ages past. You are our hope for days to come. You have been everything that we've needed. And we know, dear Lord, that you love us. You've shown it down through the years. You've shown it by the way that you've blessed us with power. You've blessed us with your love. You've blessed us by getting us through trials and tribulations that are unseen by us. But we know, dear Lord, that you've always been there. Dear Lord, we thank you today. We thank you because we've had many problems over the past year, but you have enabled us to endure them. You've been with those who have worked on the front lines against COVID-19. You've been with those who have had illnesses aside from that, and you have blessed them, dear Lord. You have healed many over the past year, and our existence here right now is because of you. We thank you, dear Lord, for this day. This day is another opportunity for us to serve you. This day is another opportunity to praise you. This day is another opportunity for us to testify to your greatness in our lives. We ask you, dear Lord, to help us as we go through these days to remember you. We need to keep in mind what you've, you've blessed us so mightily, dear Lord. And if we can just remember how you've done so, then we can have a clean and open mind about what's coming in the future. We can look toward the future with encouragement. We can look toward the future, future with hope. So we thank you, dear Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, dear Lord, for your aid. Dear Lord, we ask you now to keep us from having a religion of convenience. You ask us, dear Lord, to give our hands to work on your behalf, but we often withdraw our hands because we see the work is hard. We ask you, dear Lord, to give us the desire to work on all the things that you have for us to do. We want to be your servants. We want to be like Christ and do whatever you have willed for us to do. So we ask you, dear Lord, to help us. You have given us mouths to speak. Speak out against injustice. But when it comes time to speak, we often whisper because we don't want to be noticed. But we pray, dear Lord, that give us a bold spirit so that we can boldly go out into the world and do your will. And as Christ did, speak about how you love everyone on this earth. We thank you, dear Lord. Often, dear Lord, we also don't use our spirits to help those who are in need. We often go about being selfish to those who are around us. But help us to remember, dear Lord, that as we go out into the world, we are to give our lives to you. We are not to hold back. We are not to stop working because it is not in our schedule to do. Your schedule is our schedule, dear Lord, and we want to be a part of your kingdom, what you want us to do in this world, and we praise you. We ask you to be with those who are sick. Help them to recover if it is your will, but give them comfort, dear Lord. Be with those who've lost loved ones. Help them to realize that if they turn to you, you can calm their fears and give them a sense of peace. We ask you, dear Lord, 
to be an encourager to each of us as we continue along our life's journey. You are a mighty God. You are a loving God. We do see your glory all around us. And we pray, dear Lord, that as we come to you, that you will help us with all of our difficulties. Give us the desire to do your will. Give us the strength to be your servants. Give us the love that we can go out and share it with others. We ask you, dear Lord, for these things because only you can give them. We ask you, dear Lord, for these things because it is you who are with us each and every step of the way. And we ask you for these things, dear Lord, because we don't want to go anywhere without you. So we praise your holy name, dear Lord, today. We ask you for your blessings. We ask you to remember those who need you at this time. And we pray that as we go out, that we will remember that we can do whatever you call for us to do if we just accept the Holy Spirit into our lives. So we praise you, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord. And we ask you to be our God. In the name of Jesus, we pray at this time and for his sake. Amen, amen, and amen.
listen. Do you hear them? Our ancestors are calling to us. Encouraging us to lift up our heads with pride. To muster all of the courage we have inside. They tell the tale of perseverance and success. They tell us every obstacle was pondered and met. Here, John Mercer Langston, who founded and organized the law school of Howard University, was the first president of Virginia State University and was the first black person to be elected to the United States House of Representatives from Virginia. He paved the way for others, like his great nephew, Langston Hughes. He said, Let us dare to be free and we are so. Here, Mary Ann Shad Carey, the first black woman to edit a newspaper in North America. Her paper, The Provincial Freeman, in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, condemned slavery and solicited funds to aid fugitives from enslavement. She said, The fact that somebody is displeased is not evidence we are wrong. Here, Charlotte E. Ray, the first black female lawyer in the U.S. and the third woman admitted to a law practice. She said, I am no bird. No net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will. Here, Maria W. Stewart, the first black woman to speak publicly on political themes to a mixed race audience of men and women. She said, It is no use for us to sit with our hands folded, hanging our heads like bulrushes, lamenting our wretched condition. But let us make a mighty effort and arise and if no one will promote or respect us, let us promote and respect ourselves.
Here, Burt Williams, who with his partner, George Wall, became the first black recording artists. Williams went on to become the first major black star featured in a motion picture, Darktown Jubilee. He said, People ask me, would I give anything to be white? I answer in the words of the song, no. There is many a white man less well fortunate and less well equipped than I. In fact, I have never been able to discover that there was anything disgraceful in being a colored man. I have often found it inconvenient in America. Here, Arthur A. Schromberg, after being told by his grade school teacher that blacks had no education or history or culture, went on to gather thousands of collections of books, of manuscripts, pamphlets, and etchings documenting black culture. This collection became part of the New York Public Library. He said, Pride of race is the antidote of prejudice. Be wary, lad. The road up which you go is long and steeper than you dare to think. And since you leave in darkness, lad, be slow. Test every spring before you bend to drink. Learn now the rose may hide a hundred scars. The welcome breeze may herald storms ahead. And though your eyes would trace the course of stars, or gaze on gray horizons growing red. Let caution rule your step, that you may see the gaping pit, the waiting bog, the wall of white which you must scale. Go carefully and hopefully, but if somewhere you sink or fall, remember where you walked, you smoothed the way that those who follow may discover day.
Good morning, my Ebenezer family. My thanks go out to Deacon Thomas Epps for his uplifting and inspiring prayer this morning. I want to say kudos to our music ministry led by Sister Miriam Walton, the directors, the musicians, and the singers for the awesome expressions of African American music given to us as we celebrated our heritage this month. We also thank our drama ministry for their originality and their professional deliverance of information we should not forget. We continue to lift up our technology team, Brother LaVon Johnson Jr. and Sister Sharon Jefferson, for all the work they do to bring these services to us. Ebenezer, we are blessed to have the workers that God has placed in our midst. We thank them all. Our chosen word for the morning comes from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12 which read as follows. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love. According to thy abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, against thee only have I sinned and done that which is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified in thy sentence and blameless in thy judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Fill me with joy and gladness. Let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me 
with a willing spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Examine your heart in 2021. As we enter the second full week of Lent, we want to look at how our behavior and our minds conform to the beatitude in Matthew 5, 8 that says, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. In Christianity, the heart symbolizes the center of our core of our being, from which prayer and moral actions originate. February is the time that the American Heart Association has set aside to impress upon people the importance of becoming aware of the condition of their heart. They encourage everyone to see their doctor and to have a heart checkup. They give us the warning signs of a heart in trouble. They inform us about the right types of food we should be eating. They encourage us to take the medications that help to keep our blood pressures down. In essence, they advise us to examine the condition of our hearts. This morning, I want us to examine our spiritual hearts so that we can function and keep our hearts in good spiritual condition. I've chosen to use David's Psalm 51 as a tool of examination as we take the time to examine our hearts in 2021. David wrote the 51st Psalm after a troubled time in his life. There was a war going on in the country, but David chose to stay home out of battle. And while at home with nothing to do but to sunbathe on his roof, he spotted a woman taking her daily bath. Now David lusted after the woman Bathsheba called for her, had sex with her, and she became pregnant. He tried to trick her husband into sleeping with her, but was unsuccessful. So in order to hide his sin, he had Uriah, her husband, killed. David married her, and she birthed him a son. Now, the scripture said God was not pleased with what David had done. So God sent Nathan the prophet to David, and Nathan told him a story about a rich man and what he had done. After hearing the story, David became angry at the character and said angrily, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this should die. He must pay for the lamb four times for doing such a thing. He had no mercy. Nathan says to David, you are the man. David in anguish replies, I have sinned against God. This is a brief synopsis of the events behind the writing of Psalm 51, which is a prayer of confession, self-examination, and a cry for forgiveness. You can read the story in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 27, to get the full story. But this morning... I just want us to walk with David as he deals with his sin that has damaged his relationship and fellowship with God. In verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 51, David says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, 
and my sin is always before me against you. Against you, O Lord, only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. In 1 John 1, 8 through 9, John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, the first thing that we must understand as we seek to examine our spiritual hearts is that no matter how saved we think we are, evil is always lurking around the corner. No matter how long we have been saved, evil never leaves our sight. And even when we are doing the Lord's work, evil is always there trying to trip us up. Sometimes we find ourselves lying. Often we find ourselves hating one another or stealing joy from one another. We often find ourselves backbiting, gossiping, and killing one another with our tongues. We find ourselves robbing God and giving our tithes and offerings. We also find ourselves robbing God of faithful service, worship, and praise. Sometimes we think we are serving God, but in the depths of our being, in the depths of our hearts, there is often anger, self-centeredness, resentment, bitterness, confusion, and bondage to something or someone, leaving no space for the presence of God. When we sin, which we do, when our sins affect our relationship with God, which they do, God wants us to repent, confess, and seek forgiveness that he may bring about a change in our lives and get us back into fellowship with him. A young boy received a slingshot for his birthday, and while practicing his aim, he hit one of his grandmother's ducks, and the duck died. Thinking that his grandmother would be upset and probably not forgive him for killing the duck, he decided to hide it behind a wood pile. But his sister saw everything. And after lunch that day, the grandmother asked the sister to wash the ditch dishes, at which the sister replied, well, Johnny grandmother said that he wants to do it. The same scenario went on for weeks. Each time the boy got tired of doing the dishes, the sister would say, Remember the duck. After several days of guilt and doing both his chores and his sister's, he couldn't stand it any longer. He went to his grandmother and confessed and said he was sorry that he had killed her duck. I know Johnny while giving him a hug. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing. Because I love you, I forgave you right away. I just wondered how long you were going to let your sister make you a slave to your guilt. Like this little boy, we had the tendency to hide our sin and or cover it up thinking for some reason that God doesn't see and know it all. Do you remember Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Tell Tale 
the telltale heart. In that story, the main character commits a murder and he buries the body of the victim in his basement. The guilt of what he has done does not leave him and he begins to hear the heartbeat of his dead victim. A cold sweat pours over him as the heartbeat goes on and on and gets louder and louder. Eventually, it becomes clear to us, the reader, that the pounding of the heartbeat, which drives the man mad, was not in the grave below, but the beating was in the character's own chest. You see, that is what sin will do. It will haunt you, it will cause you unrest, and it will give you a troubled mind. David felt crushed under the weight, under the conviction of his offenses against God. After being confronted with the truth of his sinfulness, David knew that the redirection of his desires and his thoughts could only come about through the intervention of God. Therefore, David begins his prayer by asking God to have mercy on him and to blot out his transgressions, his sins. He cries, wash away all my guilt, cleanse me, and flush me with cleansing water from my sin and make me clean again. You see, there is a need in all of our lives to have a cleansing from sin. And that cleansing needs to begin in our heart. David knew this. And in his prayer, we can feel that he had a contrite heart. We can see that he is truly sorry for what he has done, and we hear his poignant confession. For you see, all sin must be confessed with a sincere heart of repentance. There's a story about a man who wrote a letter to the IRS stating, I haven't been able to sleep lately because last year, when I filled out my income tax forms, I deliberately misrepresented my income and my deductions. So I am enclosing a check for $50, and if I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. A contrite heart means to repent fully and sincerely. If we desire to have a clean heart, there must be true contrition followed by confession. We must acknowledge that we have sinned and then truly mean that we are sorry and want forgiveness. Again, David in verse 7, because of the depth of his sinfulness and his sorrow in losing favor with God says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, hyssop is a, a type of mint that was used in the Old Testament as an herb for healing and cleansing. These words of David's imply to us a good old-fashioned scrub down. Can you picture in a, in a tub of water filled with a cleansing herb, a little boy having played in dirt all day? and his mother scrubbing every speck of dirt and filth off of him. Today we have Dove, Dial, Olay, Suave, and other soaps to wash our bodies. We have Error, Tide, Persil, Game, Clorox, Bleach, all which 
can get many stains out of our clothes, but none of them can get the stain of sin off of our hands, get the stain of sin out of our heads, or get the stains of sin out of our hearts to remove sin and give us a complete cleaning is something that only God can do, which is why David cried out to his father, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of their salvation. You see, David asked for a willing spirit to obey so he would not break God's heart again. And he asked God to restore the joy of his salvation. We do not have the ability to take away a heart of sin and create a new and clean one. It is only God, our creator, and Jesus as our redeemer who can instill in us a right spirit and a pure heart, who can clean us up even after we have messed up. Yes, Noah, Noah got drunk. Abraham deceived Abimelech. Moses lost his temper and killed the man. The children of Israel were kept out of the promised land for 40 years because of disobedience. David gave into lust. Peter cussed, lied, and denied but they were all forgiven by God. They were all given a second chance with the spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were used in the service of the Lord with new attitudes. You see, if the heart is not right with God, we're only going through the motions of living. But when the heart is right with God, everything will fall into place. And God truly will receive the glory and we will be able to walk in the joy of his salvation. So what has David taught us about examining our hearts and obtaining a clean heart. First, we must admit that there is sin existing in our being that keeps us from having a healthy relationship with God. Paul in Romans 3.23 says, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of Satan's constant battle with God's people, we are all the victims of sin. Therefore, we must repent and confess our sins. Secondly, because we have all sin, we are all in need of forgiveness. We must seek that forgiveness that makes us right with God. We must be willing to cry out to a stronger power for the cleaning of our hearts. We must cry as David did, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Only, only, only the sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered on the cross can take away our sin, guilt, and shame. It is only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse our hearts and remove the stains of sin. The price, my family, has been paid for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not and will not perish but have ever lasting life. Hallelujah! Because of the Savior, Jesus Christ, we have the victory over sin, and God surely will give us clean hearts. But never forget, yes, 
Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, sin has been atoned for us. We still have to continually, daily confess our hearts to God and seek his restoration and renewal. Thirdly, there must be a change of direction and a desire to be transformed. David in verses 12 and 13 say, keep me strong by giving me a willing spirit. Then, then I will teach your ways to those who do wrong and sinners will turn back to you. When we have confessed our sins and are truly sorry for the sins of commission and omission that we have done and asked for forgiveness, God will change our hearts to where we have hearts immersed in the teachings of Christ, hearts full of the love of Christ, hearts in which we have the desire and willingness to do what will please God. Now, when you receive a good diagnosis from your heart doctor, you thank him and you go out and tell your friends all about what it takes to have a good heart. Well, when you examine your spiritual heart and do what is necessary for God to give you a good diagnosis, you need to go out and tell somebody, anybody, what God can do to make you whole again with a clean heart, a heart free from the stains of sin, a heart pumping with the blood of Jesus running through your veins. During this Lenten season, let us empty ourselves before God, repenting, confessing, and praying for a clean heart in spite of all of our unrighteousness. Let us lay our sins at the foot of the cross and allow God to cleanse us and transform us into the image of his Son. I end this sermon with this translation of Psalm 51 from the Message Bible so that the children and our youth can pray this prayer as well. It reads, generous in love, God, give grace, huge in mercy, Wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt. Soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. You are the one I have violated. And you've seen it all. Seen the full extent of my evil. Soak me, oh God in your laundry, and I'll come out clean. Scrub me, Father, and I'll have a snow-white life. Tune me into foot-tapping songs. Set these once broken bones to dancing. Don't look too close for blemishes, but give me a clean bill of health. God, Make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Bring me back from a gray exile and put a fresh wind in my sail. And amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for being a forgiving God because every day we find ourselves sinning in some way. 
But in your word, you said if we would just come, be repentant, confess our sins, and ask for forgiveness, that you surely would forgive us of every sin and toss them into the sea of forgetfulness. But Lord, we don't just want forgiveness. We want a clean heart so that we can live a life that is pleasing in your sight. So we ask that the Holy Spirit will give us the strength and the courage to constantly examine our hearts so that when we find that there is something there that is clogging up our spiritual heart arteries, we can bring them to you, confess them, and you will remove them. We thank you, Lord, for being that kind of God. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross so that we could come to you, be in your presence. And we thank you always. Now may that grace and mercy, that love, that peace, and that joy rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of us now, henceforth, and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. <laughs>